Yesterday, my identical twin uh, was from Aerobics, and now you see TensorWork. There are two different companies, but actually this is a spin-off uh, from Aerobics that we funded uh, last week. So <laughs> it's quite new. Uh, it's based in, uh, in the US, and uh, Aerobics is really focused on applying AI in real world problems. This is uh, focused on developing very focused tools uh, for data-driven develop developers uh, in the open source space. So there are two souls of the same problem. So that's, uh, uh, you've already heard this. And a um, bit of background, I've, I've been contributing to PyTorch in the last couple of years. And uh, shameless plug, I'm writing a book on PyTorch with my friend Eli Stevens. Um, and this is uh, the new entity, and um, uh, we do we want to do infrastructure for data-defined software, which is uh, basically we perceive that uh, machine learning is moving from the purely data science space to the to the development space, and developers will have to deal with programs whose behavior is not necessarily coded top down from them by them, but depends on what data that algorithm has seen, like in deep learning, for example. So from a data, uh, uh, from a software development standpoint, uh, we as developers need more tools to handle uh, the new workflows, the new development model, um, by leveraging on uh, all the software engineering best practices that we have seen in the, uh, in the last two decades, essentially. So TensorWork is set out to, to de develop some of these tools. And uh, we have, we have uh, maybe some of you have heard about this already. There was a, a great blog post by Andre Karpathy uh, from Tesla that described how data-defined software has a map to traditional software conceptually uh, where uh, the data is your source code because your model, your program will behave in a certain way depending on the data you present to it during training. Uh, what was the compiler now? It's the model and the training process, right? So compiling a program is now taking the data and, and having an artifact that behaves in a certain way and can uh, uh, react to, to inputs. Um, the executable is the train model, so this capsule of deep learning network that it has been trained, you can treat it as an executable. Then you want to run it on a virtual machine, which is, is becoming a deep learning runtime. And this talk is about a, an actual deep learning runtime. So the deep learning runtime, you can think about it as a virtual machine with a very limited instruction set, which, is the operation, which are the operations that a deep learning network does. And then you have metrics to uh, uh, do uh, testing the uh, respect of testing. And so this is how we picture it. Uh, and these are the projects we're working on with TensorBerg. Uh, we have Redis AI, which is what we are talking about today, which is a production runtime. And it's developed in collaboration with Redis Lab. Then we have Hangar, which has been released a couple of weeks ago, uh, which is a, a Tensor version store. So it's like Git for tensors, because you need to version your data, because your data is your source code. Your program will depend on how your data was. So if your client calls you up and say your model doesn't work anymore, uh, let's go back to the data it was trained on. You have a problem of traceability. You have also a problem of collaboration. So how do you take a big data set, uh, maybe have more people work on it, refine it, and then merge the changes? This is also a problem. How do you do it in a collaborative fashion? And then we'll have another couple of projects coming up later in the year. So uh, uh, two minutes on Hangar. As I, I, as I told you, it's like Git for Tensor. You can branch merge time, time travel uh, on a Tensor data set. Um, you can, there's an initial implementation of remotes, so clone, fetch, and push. And when you clone a data set, you just clone the metadata. You don't clone the actual full data so that you can materialize just parts of the data set. So you, you have to train a model or develop a model on, on Coco. 
you don't have to download the whole Coco. You download the metadata for Coco, which is just a few tens of megabytes. Then you can reason about it. You can materialize just a subset of it, develop your model on it, and then uh, eventually start training on, on the whole thing. Um, uh, the status is what you see. It's fully open source. Uh, and uh, this is more or less how you deal with it right now. The, the API, maybe it's not super final. But you can, if you use Git, you, you can find uh, that it's, uh, uh, you can find the relation to the fact that you have a repository. You can check out um, uh, uh, a repository and that makes you uh, able to access or init data sets, which uh, and a data set is a collection of tensors uh, indexed by, by uh, the first dimension, which is the batch dimension usually. Then you can commit changes to it and then uh, you can create a branch, check it out, uh, change an item, and then commit it, and then merge. So it's kind of, uh, once of you who use Git uh, would know what this means. And you can create histories like you do in Git. Here's the pro project. We could really use a star, because to be heard, you need stars nowadays. So this is, you know, wait, I could. I would really appreciate it. <laughs> so today we're here to talk about Redis AI, which is another uh, fundamental piece that I think uh, would be quite useful if you take deep learning models uh, in production. And as I said, it's uh, developed in collaboration with Redis Labs. Um, so there are multiple deep learning frameworks. Uh, you go through a training process, and then you have to put that in production. So what does it mean to uh, take a deep, deep learning model in production? Of course, you could talk to your data scientists. They will give you a notebook or something that you could put on, in a Docker container and serve it. But there are better, more scalable ways, also because um, uh, GPU time costs a lot of money. So if you, if you go at scale, you want to squeeze every inch of compute you have. Uh, while your, your GPU instances are up. So if you spend time <coughs> behind a, an inefficient code, uh, then you're, you're wasting your money. And there are entities that are really large, and the, of course, this is not beneficial. And also, another thing, you want to make your deployment strategy independent on the framework. Uh, we, we're seeing many frameworks. Uh, some prefer some framework, some, some other, other frameworks. I, I don't. Uh, I, I use PyTorch all the time, but it's not that uh, I'm, we are focused on PyTorch uh, specifically. Uh, I think framework independence is a, is a very important thing to have, also because you can rely on pre-trained models uh, that come from that, uh, independently from uh, the framework they were trained on. So production strategies goes, go all the way from uh, really, uh, putting your Python code behind a Flask server uh, or exporting a network from uh, one of these frameworks and uh, buy compute time on, on Google or Amazon. But sometimes you cannot do that because you have to take your execution close to your data uh, or you want to, to run your own infrastructure or other things that we will see. So there are some runtimes being developed right now. These are the principal ones. For sure, uh, 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 they're not the only ones, but the ones that come to mind. Or you develop a bespoke solution sometimes in uh, C++, but this is the model <coughs> server architecture. So you have a model file, uh, you put it inside a server, and then you have some kind of API for serving that. And of course, the piece that you develop there has to fit your existing strategy, right? So uh, you would like another thing coming out, down your stack. So uh, you want your building blocks to be as composable as possible. You, you want to learn a technology that then can run anywhere, cloud, big installation, just small things, Raspberry Pi. You want to something that, that is nimble enough so that you can scale. And then you want to minimize the amount of moving data. Uh, because if you have data somewhere in your stack, and then you, want, you have uh, your deep learning 
uh, service somewhere, then you probably also want some queue system somewhere else. So now you have three components, and then you have to move your data uh, to the queuing system and then uh, to the serving uh, server, which is fine. But if you can compress all this into one thing, then it's probably uh, a good idea. So how many of you use Redis or know what, to, what Redis is? OK. A fair amount, but not, not all of you. So Redis is a fast in-memory multi-model database. It's also uh, conceived as a data structure server. So you can have multiple data structures that you can uh, assign values to and, and, and use on the server side. And uh, you have strange hashes, which are dictionaries, lists, sets, sorted sets, and uh, others. Well, one, a new one is stream. Uh, it's in memory, but you can also persist data with certain guarantees. Uh, you, have, you can do replication, so you can have multiple uh, Redis uh, instances around. And you can have auto failover, auto master election, or use them in a cluster so that your data is partitioned across instances. Clients are basically in any language you can think of. And now, uh, recently, there's support for modules. So you can write a C program that extends data structures with commands in Redis. And so what we've done is we uh, created Redis AI as a Redis module providing tensors as a data type. Tensor is a multidimensional array. Uh, a deep learning model uh, execution uh, using multiple backends and that can run on CPU and GPU. So it turns Redis into a full-fledged deep learning runtime while still being ready. So it operate, you can operate on it like, so if you know Redis, if you know how it scales, if you know how to deploy it, then you already know how to use Redis AI. So you become a deep learning engineer and you can ask for pay raise. So this is what Redis AI is. There's a tensor. Now Redis picks tensors. You can set and get them. You can install deep learning graphs from PyTorch TensorFlow, and in a few weeks also any Onyx model. Onyx is a standard format for deep learning graphs. And not only, it, it has Onyx ML, which is a, a, a cousin uh, that can also store random forest, so traditional machine learning models, random forest. Uh, uh, support vector machines and so on. You can run your models on the CPU on multiple GPUs. And also it has something called for script. Does this remind you of anything? Right? It looks like Python. But it's not actually that there's a Python interpreter in here. PyTorch has an interpreter for Python-like code that can run directly without invoking the Python uh, interpreter. And it, it exposes all the tensor API from Python. So now, it, which is really similar to NumPy. So now you can actually send <laughs> fragments of code to Redis and it will execute on CPU and GPU. Dealing with tensors, of course you don't, you cannot import modules and so on. And you can do it in a highly available fashion. So now you have an object that you can use to scale up your uh, deep, deep learning model. Why is it important to be able to store a tensor? Say you have a, a chatbot application, a chatbot with a, one of the latest models where the state of your conversation is preserved. So usually you have this kind of seek to seek models where your sentence or, uh, is encoded into a vector and then uh, the response is decoded back. And then at the next step, you can use an intermediate uh, uh, representation to hold your, the state of your conversation so that your next uh, uh, responses will depend also on what, what your conversation was previously. And so in this case, you can, get, uh, you can set some data, get a reply, and then there's a state that can be held within the, your data, your database. But if you are in a replicated environment, then automatically this state of your conversation is replicated ac across the cluster. And then, of course, your instance will go down. <coughs> and this is a problem, uh, but 
thanks to the auto preloader mechanism, so Redis, another instance will be elected as master, and you will uh, already have the state of your conversation there, so your user will not notice that your instance went there. Okay. So it's a, it's a typical uh, high availability uh, scenario, but this time with tensors. Uh, and so this is the architecture. It's really simple if you go into the source code. Uh, there, there is a queue, so you don't have to keep a, a queue, uh, an external queue. There is a queue being, being uh, uh, consumed on a parallel thread, so it already handles back pressure. So if you send 100 requests to it, it will serialize them. Soon there will be more than one queue, and as many queues as there are devices. Uh, and then in the compute thread, you will have the computation running, and then uh, the client will be unblocked with the response. You can get it from the GitHub repository. There is already a Docker container. This is how you speak to it. So you can set a tensor at a key. So this is a key. So you, then you can, you can retrieve a, the tensor by specifying the key. You can specify the data type and uh, uh, the shape, two by two, and the values, or a, blo a binary blob. And of course, you can do it from uh, any um, uh, client library. Uh, we have a client library for Python. And, uh, uh, and we have example code that works from Go and JavaScript as well. Uh, at the core, there is a, a data structure uh, that it represents tensors. We won't go into that today. And this is how you set the model. You export it from Python uh, in a way that we'll uh, show in a second. And then usually when you export a trained model, you get a proto protocol buffer uh, binary that you can set to a key. And now Redis AI will know that this is a torch model that has to execute on the GPU. And, and those are the bytes uh, containing all the operations and the weights. Same thing for TensorFlow. Uh, and uh, for TensorFlow, you have to specify what are the name of the nodes in the graph that represent inputs and outputs. But it's essentially, essentially the same thing. And then you can run the model by saying, run this model at this key using this key tensor as input and this key as output. Okay. So it's pretty simple. And so this is from Python, how you export model from TensorFlow. This is TensorFlow 1. TensorFlow 2 support is going to come. Now TensorFlow 2 in, is in the early stages. So we're waiting until things settle down a bit. Um, so you basically have your graph already uh, that you already trained. And you can freeze it uh, and then just write the graph. Free, freezing a graph in TensorFlow means that all the variables are uh, converting to constants, so you cannot train it anymore, but you can run it on, uh, not in the code that you use to train. And a very similar thing it happens with PyTorch. PyTorch is a JIT compiler that is also capable of tracing, and there are other mechanisms as well. Uh, that, so you have your trace model that can be saved into <coughs> a, a protocol buffer file that you can install into Redis AI. And script, I mentioned that you can write Python code that is interpreted directly within uh, uh, Redis, uh, thanks to the libtorch uh, the, uh, torch script interpreter in, in PyTorch. And this is an example. So you have a function add to A plus B. You can all use all the, uh, the, the Tensor API. You can install it. You can ask Redis to run it on the GPU. And now you can say, OK, at this key, there is a script that has a function called odd2. This is the input key for a tensor that I set previously. Outputs bar, and it will store a new tensor in bar that will have the same values. So uh, this is what, what you can do. Persistence, uh, you can save the state of your database to disk so that when you switch it off and switch it on, you will have the same tensors, the same models. Uh, replication, as we mentioned, you have a master replica. 
So you can actually run read-only comments on the replicas as well. So you can scale it up pretty easily. You set the model, the model will be replicated automatically, and now you can also uh, run purely read-only comments on the, on the replicas or read-write comments on the master. And there's also cluster support, which is a bit crude right now, but it will shard your models and your keys, your tensors across a cluster. Uh, you can look up, the, there's a Java uh, client, there's a Python client, and the Python client makes it also a bit easier for you to export data uh, from a, a, net, a train network. So you can use the Python client to uh, do this export phase, which is a bit tricky if you don't know TensorFlow in detail or, or PyTorch. So you can already use it today. There is a, an examples data set that we can look into uh, briefly. Um, it keeps the data local, so you don't have to move the data. You can keep your tensor data in Redis, do whatever you do with Redis, expire keys and so on, and also transform that data into some other data that you can, can get without ha actually having the data come back and forth to your process. It, it runs everywhere, Redis runs, uh, it's multi backend, multiple backends are going to be added soon, and it uh, keeps your model hot in memory or in GPU without going back and forth. And so we try to really squeeze every inch of computation. Uh, there is also a benchmark uh, repository where we're tracking how well we're doing compared to other uh, uh, serving solutions. Um, I will probably not go too much in depth into the roadmap. This is something that, so general availability will be in July. Uh, we're adding direct acyclic graph comments that will allow you to specify some of the keys as volatile, so they, are never, they never hit key space, but you can refer to them in the comments so that essentially uh, comments can become purely read-only, so if you have uh, if you set a tensor on a volatile key, then use that key to run a model as the input and use a volatile key on the output and then get the tensor at the volatile key, this is a purely read-only comment. So you can run it on replicas. Otherwise, you have to set the tensor and then run it, which is a bit more costly. Um, so, yeah. So there will, there will be this background read-only that will allow you to do pretty complicated things. And another advantage, advantage of this is that if you run on different devices, it will try to uh, run them in sequence, but optimize the fact that uh, you, you, can, you could have three independent model runs and then aggregating the, the results to do ensembling. And those three will be able to run in parallel if you have multiple devices, like this. So you can reason about a DAG but a DAG only runs, only exists in, in the context of a single call. So it's a DAG. You can do DAG-like optimizations, but within the context of a single call, and that simplifies a lot. Okay, so stream integration, as I said, on XML for machine learning models. So I would say, it, I, I think, I hope, it's, it's going to be a great resource for Python developers that have to talk to people that do that go in production and that do not want to have your uh, data science code directly go in production but want to have some more oversight over it and being able to heavily log what happens inside it and so on. So um, th this is the reason why we're doing that. And if you do it at scale, even, even better. There will be some auto-batching uh, strategies so that if you, in the queue, you have a bunch of operations and you can stack uh, some equal operation uh, 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 along the batch dimension, you can do that and it runs a, a little bit faster. And other uh, uh, opportunities for optimization. You will be able to uh, dynamically load the backends very shortly now and monitor what's happening inside Red Well, then there's your enterprise with some more uh, fancy dashboarding. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, before we go into and take a peek at the, at the Python code, um, I'd like to thank Shane Thomas, and, which is working uh, 
from Bangalore on both Anger and, and Redis AI, and then my co-founders Rikito and Pietro Rota, the Red, people at Redis Labs who is contributing, who are contributing to uh, to this effort, and everyone at Aerobics <coughs> because we are getting to this thanks to the fact that Aerobics is the number one user of, of these technologies and all the use cases uh, are built around the experience that we are going through aerobics. Um, there's a nice <laughs> uh, blog post that Sharon has, has written. Uh, this is of course ironic, but uh, it doesn't look like from this <laughs> um, screenshot. And um, I'm going to show you uh, some code. from the examples repository. Okay, so in the examples repository, you have code that shows you how to export models. We have three examples, an ImageNet example, where you uh, guess the content of an image by displaying an image and uh, running uh, a network, uh, RedNet 50, that has been trained on ImageNet. Then you have a char RNN to generate text. Uh, and so it shows you how to deal with uh, recurrent uh, state. And then uh, a chatbot example, which is uh, more fun. And it's a full-fledged, uh, this is just the models part. Uh, and if you go into the model saver, you will see that there's an encoder, which is the, what, the, the portion that encodes the sentence. <coughs> there's an attention mechanism and then a decoder, and then in the end, of course you have to know things, uh, how things work a little bit, but in the end you trace your encoder and decoder, and then you can save them as a Python. So this is the part where you take an existing model, you add those lines to trace the computation and save and freeze your computation into a, a binary block. And then you have several examples of the client side, which are the applications, essentially. Uh, for example, Im ImageNet PyTorch. Uh, you can import uh, some libraries to load images, but of course these could come from a, uh, a client in a web service. And then you just execute commands. This doesn't use the, the Python client library, but it's just raw uh, uh, Redis Python client. So you execute a command model set and you set the model or the script and then you can execute and you get things back. So if you have to implement your, you integrate this into your own web service, then it becomes quite easy to have a, a microservice that takes care of all the computation that runs on the GPU and so on and then it decouples all your infrastructure uh, that the microservices that actually serve the, the web, web app. And you can see a more complete uh, example here where you have a Flask application that will serve your chatbot. Uh, you have a couple of routes that in, in, in this case will get uh, the message from, from the request and then it will ask the Redis DB to process that, but Redis DB is really just uh, another file that call, calls into Redis AI. So you, you init by setting the model, both the encoder and the decoder of your chatbot application that you can load from, from a file. And at this point, Redis AI will have this model loaded. It knows it's a torch model and it will have to run on the CPU and then we, we, when you call process, all it does is takes the array of the encoded words and then uh, sets the tensors, run, get the tensor back. Uh, yeah, runs for all the, the words that you had. And then uh, uh, gets the output here. Tensor get. Okay, um, so this is more or less how you use it. It's not a lot different from what you would use, uh, how you would use uh, 
Redis from Python in, in a typical application. Only that you, you deal with tensors now. Okay, so I think I'm gonna give you a few minutes back. Um, I'll be happy to hear questions if you have them. And uh, I hope you can try this out and maybe open issues on, on GitHub. We're in a very active development phase. The general availability, as I said, is gonna be July, so we have an, another couple of months to stabilize every, everything, but actually the API is quite stable already. So we just have to add Onyx support, uh, multiple queues per device to support multi, uh, uh, multi device and, uh, and parallelize a bit more, and, and we, I think we're done. Okay, good, thank you. Thank you, Luca. Sometimes we forgot the part uh, to put things on production, so that could be very helpful. Uh, there's uh, any question for the public? Everyone is already hungry. Okay. Uh, it's a uh, great uh, talk, great TV, So you. it's uh, really, really amazing. But um, I, I was a bit. Um, you made me think a bit about the vision part. You know, the one that actually doesn't. Yeah. Have to do with the presentation. Sorry for that. Yeah. yeah. Um, you were saying data-driven software, yeah. but isn't development driven by intent, and data doesn't have intent in it, so how? Well, the intent, yeah, it's a very good question. So the intent is you crafting your data set so that it contains the intent. You know, the annotation drives the intent of the data-driven software, so how you annotate it. So um, data, Exactly because we have to give a data-driven software intent, you need some way of versioning your data so that you can transform it so that it, rep it represents your intent uh, precisely. And so that's why I think we need collaboration tools. We need to stop thinking about data as a huge two gigabytes binary blob, but having the possibility of saying, okay, this network's, uh, network works better than the other the models are the same. Let's look at the difference between time traveling across the, the data set. What changed? You know? And be able to maybe not even just materialize the changes so that you can run uh, all the Python ecosystem on those changes only and not having a binary blob that you, know, you can manage. And these kind of uh, practicalities are what, what makes the difference in terms of uh, as a uh, quick evolution and quick improvement of, of your workflow, like Git. It's not that we couldn't make copy one, two, chow, people, people two, or even use CVS, but uh, no, CSV, I, I, I started with that so, so long ago, or, uh, you know. Um, but Git really made the difference in the way we collaborate, you know. So we, we want to, 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 to bring the same kind of improvements and uh, uh, in, into the space. I don't know if these are the right tools. I, we think they are, but I think that we'll see a lot more coming up in the future. Yeah, in the near future. Any other question? Please raise your hand. Okay, thank you again, Luca. Thank you.